recording all the classes. Are you recording? Yes, you are. Okay, this can be hard for me for a couple of minutes because I've got a cough drop in my mouth because my sore is so, my throat is so sore. Or my sore is so throat, whichever the case is. Page 907, we're finishing Ben Johnson's just get rid of it. Um, epitaph on Shakespeare. And I think we left on 65. <coughs> we, ju <coughs> Excuse me. we just finished with Johnson saying Shakespeare was born with talent, but then he had to hone it. He had to work every time he wrote something. And some scholars, some critics, take this as it's obviously not incontrovertible proof, but it is proof of sorts that Shakespeare of Warwick was the writer and that Johnson knew him and Johnson knew his, his practices for writing, revising, etc. With the talk about, you know, those who cast to write a living line must sweat and strike the second heat upon the muse's anvil, turn the same and himself with it that he thinks to frame, or for the laurel he may gain a scorn, for a good poet's maid, as well as born. That could also be a little bit of uh, Johnson talking about himself. Okay? Because you wouldn't think a good poet would be born to a bricklayer. I mean, that's the, there's that mentality of, you know, father's a bricklayer, guess what? You're going to be a bricklayer. Your son's going to be a bricklayer. It's kind of the, the union household model. Um, so to speak, which idea, by the way, goes back to the medieval guilds. So he goes on, and such wert thou, that is, you were made as well as born a poet. You made yourself into a poet. And he gives us, in the lines that follow, what he kind of thinks is the evidence. Look how the father's face lives in his issue. Go back to some of the early sonnets where the, the speaker is addressing the golden-haired youth and says, go out, reproduce, why? So that when you are old and wrinkled and ugly, people can look at your child and say, ah, oh, there he is. Look how the father's face lives in his issue. What is his issue? his works, his poems, his plays. Now, the first folio does not include Shakespeare's poetry. It's only the plays, all right? So Johnson is suggesting, if we want to get to know Shakespeare, turn to his plays, and you'll learn, or you'll get to know Shakespeare. Even so, the race of Shakespeare's mind and manners brightly shines in his well-turned and true filed lines. The race. The ancestry, or excuse me, the descendants of Shakespeare are found where? In his bright, um, brightly shines in his well-turned and true filed line. But it's the race of Shakespeare's mind, the offspring of his mind and manners. So you can get to, again, no Shakespeare kind of intellectually and almost, I would say, even emotionally. In his well-turned and true filed lines, in each of which he seems to shake a lance. Now that could be an allusion to Robert Greene's um, Groat's Worth of Wit and A Million of Repentance, where Greene is the first one to refer to Shakespeare as being in London, written, this is written in 1592, because he has a comment in there about shaking a scene which everybody takes to be an allusion to Shakespeare, all right? By the way, in, um, I always mean to bring that in, and I always forget. In, I think it's the 46th Psalm. This is in a guy, guy's book named, oh, come on, brain work, Richard Lehrer. The Miracle of Language. 
he's got a chapter on Shakespeare. And he points out that in 16, what? Try to get the years right. Shakespeare was born in 1564. Right? Yes. In six, 15, in 1610, the height of the work on the King James Bible, the translation, okay? Shakespeare was 46 years old. Just a little side note here. In the 46th Psalm, if you go down from the, the beginning in the King James, from the very first word in the 46th Psalm, you'll come across the word shake, shake or shakes, one of the two. If you count up 46 words from the very bottom, I think not including the Selah at the end, which means essentially amen. If you count up 46 words from there, you have the word spear. Okay? He does this kind of jokingly. I mean, he's I don't think he's necessarily serious that this is the case. But he suggests that others have suggested that, look, Shakespeare is embedded in the greatest work of, some say, of Elizabethan English language, the King James Bible. And even people who hate the Bible, hate Christianity, etc., say, have said, this is the greatest work because of the sound the cadence of the language, the music of the poetry in the Old Testament poetry of which Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, etc., are. Okay, anyways. So, shake a lance, you know, Shakespeare, down 46 words, up 46 words. Kind of interesting. Just one of those little, doo -doo -doo -doo, you know, you kind of wonder. Uh, in each of which he seems to shake a lance as brandished at the eyes of ignorance. Shaking his spear at you, you dullards, you dotards, you idiots out there. Sweet swan of Avon. Those who are you, Shakespeare, really is Shakespeare. They look at that and go, look, Johnson's telling us he was from Avon. Now, I can't remember where I saw this. Somewhere in the last year or two, somebody suggested... No, no, no. Swan of Avon doesn't refer to somebody actually from Stratford. It can refer to any of the swans that inhabit the river Avon, which flows into the Thames, etc. Well, okay. I mean, yes, I guess you could say it refers to any swan anywhere that just happens to fly and land into the Avon. Anyways, sweet swan of Avon. <clears throat> go to the theater in Stratford and it's called The Swan. Okay, There's also a bunch of pubs called The Swan. What a sight it were to see thee in our waters yet appear. That's kind of implying this sweet swan of Avon is absent. Well, Shakespeare's been dead seven years. And make those flights upon the banks of Thames that did, that so did take Eliza and our gems. Because, you know, it's supposed to rhyme. Make those flights upon the banks of Thames that so did take Eliza and our gems. James. What? What is he talking about? What flights that took Queen Elizabeth and King James? Louder? Um, no, not necessarily. Have you ever seen a flock of swans? You know, they just kind of come up suddenly and they take flight. It's pretty amazing. It takes your breath away. He's saying Shakespeare's works did that. We know anecdotal evidence. Okay, we know this from anecdotal evidence. Hens Henslow's diary, other things like that. Queen Elizabeth liked Shakespeare's plays. It is said that she was so taken with Falstaff, character of Falstaff, 
in the, in the Henry the Fourth plays, Henry the Fourth parts one and two, that she asked Shakespeare to write a play just about Falstaff, a play that focuses on Falstaff. Rather than Falstaff being a secondary character, have Falstaff be the main character. And according to the story, Shakespeare wrote The Merry Wines of Windsor, which features Sir John Falstaff as the main character trying to get in and out of the beds of the Merry Wives of Windsor. Why Windsor? Windsor Castle, the Queen's home. Okay, So she asked for a play on Falstaff and goes, here you go, you know, my liege, and it's, you know, set in Windsor the whole nine yards. Okay? King James also liked Shakespeare and Shakespeare's plays. When King Shakespeare's troop, when Elizabeth was alive, wasn't called the Queen's Men. It was the Lord Chamberlain's Men. When King James became king, the troop was renamed because it took on or that's not the right phrase. It received new patronage. It became the king's men. James himself became the patron for that acting company. Okay? But stay. So he, he kind of visually imagines. Here's Shakespeare as the sweet swan of Avon, Avon coming down the Thames. Well, the globe is on what's called Bankside. It's the south bank of the Thames. You, you can't miss it. You can't miss it today. You couldn't have missed it in Shakespeare's day. And it's like Shakespeare is sailing down, bird, swimming down, I guess, the Thames, and suddenly something happens. But stay, I see thee in the hemisphere. This sweet swan of Avon has done not, has done what? Taken flight. Why? Johnson's going to give us an image. Advanced. So the bird rises. Rises how high? And made a constellation there. This is... Shakespeare's apotheosis. This is Shakespeare's being made into a god. By Johnson's terminology, okay? Obviously, not literal, it's figurative. Shine forth, thou star of poets. Why shine forth? Why shine forth, thou star of poets? Johnson, even though he's writing this in 1623, he's hearkening back to an earlier cosmological view that we talked a little bit about the other day. We're going to talk even more about, or re-talk about today with um, Dunn. Shakespeare will now become what? An influential star, like in the Zodiac, on England. So, shine forth, thou star of poets, and with rage or influence, chide or cheer, the drooping stage. Notice, rage or influence. What do those two terms mean or imply? Connote or denote? Rage denotes what? If you're full of rage, you're angry. Angry, not anger. I was telling one of my colleagues today, I, my brain is so shut off. What about influence? Influence isn't anger, you know, we have today. Johnson didn't know about this, obviously. We have influencers today. Term I just absolutely, you know, want to throw up when I hear and or read. What does it mean? It means you have power to persuade your mind. Okay. So, he says, with rage or influence, chide or cheer. So, with rage... Chide what? What's the object? I mean, that's what the rage and chiding does. But what's what's to receive? The, the, the drooping. Our drooping stage. 
What does drooping mean? I was upstairs. I was on my roof. I was pulling some stuff down yesterday afternoon. And I noticed several years ago we had an ice dam on our roof. Ice dam is when snow builds up in the gutters and then it turns to ice. It was when we had a big snowstorm four or five years ago. And we had leaks in our kitchen where this was because the snow and ice lift as they expand. They lift the shingles. And as it gradually starts to melt right there, on beneath the shingles, it drips through. So I was pulling on this wire that I bought a couple of years ago to install so that if we get heavy snow, it keeps it warm and doesn't do that. And I noticed there's this little, little hollow spot. And I thought, well, that doesn't look right. And I pulled the shingles up and the roof sheathing is rotted. I mean, rotted, rotted. It's drooping. Chide our drooping, our rotted, our dying stage. Or what? With influence, cheer the drooping stage. Come on, guys, you're down 100 to nothing, but you can do it. I know you have it in you. Right? A coach can do one of two things. You can berate the individual or the team. You guys suck, and you're always going to suck. You're never going to win, which can either make them shut down or, oh, yeah, well, we're going to show you. Or you can use the positive reinforcement. You know, it's the carrot or the stick approach. Johnson doesn't care which one he uses. What's the point? The stage now what? Shakespeare's gone and the stage sucks. The stage meaning London Theater. The London Theater District. What we would today call the West End. The London Theater District. Okay? Which, which goes back to drooping stage. Since thy flight from hence, since you left us, not in 1616, Shakespeare left London 1612, hath mourned like night and despair's day, but for thy volume's light. Without Shakespeare's volume, and Johnson, by using the term volume, he doesn't say words, he doesn't say words, he doesn't say place, he says volume. What's he referring to? That actual first folio. Hold on, just one second. Shakespeare's first folio, okay? Pass around, that's a facsimile copy. Um, not every page in there is from a single version or copy of the text. It's made up of multiples, um, essentially. But that's what he's referring to when he says the volume. In other words, now, 1623, now that this book has been published, what? The stage can come back. One of the major people writing for the plays, writing for the theater at this point, is Ben Johnson. He's writing masks. But they're not as popular as Shakespeare's plays. Okay? <coughs> okay, we'll stop with Johnson and move on to Dunn. And I'm going to skip the good morrow for a moment. We're going to go to the canonization, which is, I just went past it, on uh, 916, 917. 
Background about Dunn. I think I've said a little bit about this before. And you got, yeah, it's a heavy sucker. <coughs> um, in 1598, Introduction mentions one of his uncles, I think, um, was Dunn's mother was related to Thomas More. This is the bottom of the first page of the introduction. Thomas More, Sir Thomas More, Saint Thomas More, Catholic Church, uh, was beheaded because he didn't support Henry VIII's request for a divorce. Um, two of two of Dunn's Mother's uncles lived in exile. Another was incarcerated. In 1593, Dunn's brother Henry died of a uh, fever while being imprisoned because he harbored a priest. Dunn's brother harbored a priest. Okay, So, I mean, his family was really Catholic. They weren't just kind of <clears throat> nominal Catholic. All right? Sometime, we don't know why, late, 1590s, mid-1590s maybe, Dunn starts to have a, a spiritual crisis of sorts. Um, doubting his Catholicism, doubting what's the true church, etc. Read, just on your own, you don't, it's not for the exam or anything like that, but if you're kind of interested, read his satire three, titled On or Of Religion. And it's the satire is about what's the true church. Is it the Protestant church? Is it the church Luther talked about? Is it the church Calvin talked about? Or is it the church in Rome? And he puts it in the language, is it in Rome? Is it in Geneva? Or is it in London? The Anglican church, okay? He finishes the satire essentially saying, I don't know. The important thing is to search for the true church, okay? Couple other things. 1598, Dunn goes to work, this is in your introduction, for Sir Thomas Edgerton. He's the keeper of the seal. That's the bit, it's about six inches in diameter. I've seen this, um, the imprint of this on documents before in National Record Office and things like that, a uh, public record office. Keeper of the seal is like the second or third most important person in the government. Whenever the queen or king needed something royally sealed, you sent for the keeper of the seal who brought the seal, who affixed it on the wet wax. Okay? So Dunn goes to work for him as his personal secretary in 1598. So Dunn's 26 at that point. In 1601, so Dunn's 26 then, three years later, he's 29. In 1601, he gets married to Anne Moore, and in 1601, she's 17. They probably met in 1598, therefore, when she was 14. She, Anne Moore, is Edgerton's niece. So Doug goes to work for him. When he's 26, she's 14. They meet. She's impressed. He's already been a soldier. He's fought in the Spanish Wars. He's already been a member of Parliament. So Dunn's on this kind of trajectory. He's rising. He's rising fast. He's already acknowledged in poetry and other works as being one of the greatest minds of his generation. Okay? Um, he's his poetry has been widely circulated. I think I mentioned in here before. Of all the Renaissance poets, Dunn's poetry is the most widely circulated by far. Over 5,000 copies 
of over a little more than 200 poems. Shakespeare's doesn't come close. Nobody's comes close. Everybody loved Dunn's stuff for some reason. Okay? So they get married when he's 29 and she's 17. The marriage is kept secret for about three months. Some of Dunn's poems, it is clear, are talking about this relationship before and just after they are married. So some of Dunn's poems can easily be read autobiographically. Okay? When the marriage is discovered, two things happen. One, her father is very irate. Her father is a sir in his own right. Sir Thomas, not the other one. This is different more. Sir Thomas More, okay? And her uncle is also very irate. Dunn gets fired and thrown into jail. Fired by her uncle, thrown into jail by her father, okay? Where he stays. <laughs> for I think it is about four months. Um, interestingly, hardly anything survives, poetry-wise. There's one poem that survives in Dunn's own handwriting. It's what's called a verse letter, okay? But we have about 20 letters between Dunn and his father-in-law that are in the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. Um, I think you can look at them online. And they talk about, you know, normal stuff. This is at a point when they're getting along. Okay? So, King James becomes king, 1603. James puts it in his head that he wants John Dunn to become a priest, Anglican priest. He wants him to become a priest because he wants Dunn to be his personal court, royal priest, chaplain, if you want if you want to put it that way. Dunn doesn't want to become a priest. He spends the 16 aughts essentially writing poetry for other people, celebrating weddings and anniversaries and funerals and that kind of stuff. He's also writing love poetry. This is the stuff that's being circulated, his songs and sonnets. Okay? Sometime, late 16 aughts, 1608, 9, 10, somewhere around there, this, this spiritual journey that began in the 1590s, he makes a decision. He's no longer Catholic. Why? He writes this long um, work <coughs> called Ignatius his Conclave. Ignatius, the founder of the Jesuit movement. You know, the Spanish Inquisition, that Ignatius. His enclave, or St. Uh, Ignatius, his conclave, his conclave is a meeting of Jesuits in hell. He puts them all in hell. Not the kind of thing a, a good card-carrying Catholic um, would do. He also writes, sometime in that same period, a work called Bia, Thanatos. Bia means self. Anybody know what Thanatos means? Death. It's an argument for suicide. That is about as anti Catholic as you can be. In fact, that's about as anti Christian as you can be. Because Protestants were, as, you know, that's one point where Protestants and Catholics were in total unanimity. You can't kill yourself and call yourself a Christian. Um, 1615, he takes what's called holy orders, becomes an Anglican priest. Shortly before that, he writes a letter to a friend. The letter is a verse letter, so it's a letter written as poetry, where he asks this friend for that collection of poems that he had given him, lent him, I think is the word he actually uses. Because he says he's taking holy orders and he wants to make a valediction to the world. What's a valediction? We're going to read a poem called A Valediction Forbidding Morning. Vale means goodbye, diction, word, or speech. It's a farewell speech. He wants to write, essentially, a farewell to the world. And the way he's going to do that is he's going to collect all the poems, love poems primarily, 
He's written before, republished them, probably prefaced with a, I take all this back, kind of like Chaucer's retraction at the end of the Canterbury Tales. Chaucer essentially says at the end of the Canterbury Tales in his retraction, if anything I've said in here has offended anybody, please, I'm sorry, I never meant to offend anybody. I was just merely restating what these people said and pray for my sorry soul, you know, kind of a thing. Well, Dunn, it thought, was going to do that same thing. Interestingly, that little book, it's lost. We don't know what happened to it. Because we don't have, other than that one first letter to a different guy, not to Henry Goodyear, we don't have any of those poems in his own handwriting. Okay? So, takes holy orders. Very quickly he progresses. Okay? He and his wife are still married. She's popping out babies. Twelve. Twelve. They get married in 1601. She dies 1600, 1601. She dies in 1617. Twelve children in that 16 to 17 year span. I think four of them are either still, stillborn or die in infancy. At least one of them is stillborn. Okay? None of Dunn's descendants are alive today. Dunn doesn't have any descendants today. Shakespeare doesn't have any descendants today. John Milton doesn't have any descendants today. It's like they spend all their genes writing, so to speak. Okay? It's odd. Don't know why that is. Um, 16, what? 16, your introduction probably says. 1621, I was going to say 1619, Dunn is appointed Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral. That makes him the highest ranking person at St. Paul's. St. Paul's Cathedral in Dunn's time is not the St. Paul's we see today. The St. Paul's we see today was designed by Sir Christopher Wren, I believe it was, um, because the St. Paul's Cathedral that Dunn preached at burned down in the Great Fire of 1666, which wiped out most of London. Most of Shakespeare's London is gone. You can see a few buildings. For example, you can go to the church that was a couple blocks away from where Shakespeare lived that Shakespeare attended. We know he attended there because there are some records that suggest that. Okay. So, Dean of St. Paul's. He's now delivering sermons regularly. All right. Um, well over 150 sermons survive. Dunn is such a sermonizer that after 1700, he's known primarily for his sermons, not for his poetry. He's not really praised for his poetry again until the early 20th century. Uh, a professor of English, a, a scholar named Herbert Grierson, came out with an edition of Dunn's poems in, 16, uh, me, in 1912, two-volume edition, and then T.S. Eliot writes an essay in the 1920s, just, talk, just called, if I remember correctly, on the metaphysical poets, something like that. That revives Dunn. So that from that point on, Dunn, for the Renaissance at least, is one of the most popular authors to be written about. It's, I think it is on something like, on average, about 30 scholarly articles a year are written about Dunn from around 1930 forward. Shakespeare has more. Ben Johnson does not. In fact, there's really nobody else that has that much, that often written about him. So Dunn's, Dunn's way up there at the top. Okay? He dies in 1631. Just before his death, he knows he's dying. He does two things. He writes a poem about his death. Excuse me. He writes a sermon about his death called Death's Duel, okay? and he poses for his effigy. He knows there will be a statue of him put in St. Paul's because he was the dean. So he strips naked, puts his winding sheet around him, his shroud, lies down flat, and a sketch is made. From the sketch, a sculptor sculpts this effigy. It's about the only thing that survives from the Great Fire of London in the destruction of St. Paul's Cathedral. You go to St. Paul's Cathedral today, 
And you will see this effigy standing there. And there are marks on it from the fire. Okay? One of the times when I was in London teaching, my family came, you know, we did our, our pilgrimage because my dissertation was undone. You know, I had to salute the, uh, so to speak, say hi to the sculpture. So, a couple more comments about Dunn. Prior to taking holy orders, and probably prior to his marriage, some people will say, no, he kept it up after he was married, Dunn was known pretty much as a pretty rascally, man-about-town kind of guy. He was a libertine. Sexually loose, in other words. In some of the poems, pretty much indicate that. Um, Dunn was one of those poets in a large group called a university wit. We don't know that Dunn actually ever attended university. He's not on any rolls. Okay? But he's so well educated that it's assumed he had to have attended university. Um, and the university wits would often try to outdo each other. You know, they'd, they'd write a kind of a genre of poetry and say, oh yeah? Well, let me see if I can outdo that. Okay. One of the things they tried to do was out Ovid. Ovid. Ovid, you know, one of the great poets of love. Okay. Usually pretty risque poetry. Dunn and others tried to see if they could write dirty poetry without it being overtly dirty. In other words, the use of double entendre and innuendo and such. And you're going to... Uh, don't know that we're going to see any of those. Um... Read Elegy it's in here. Elegy 19 to his mistress going to bed. Okay? On page 925. And you get a lot of that. Interestingly, this manuscript. This poem, excuse me, I've seen this in many manuscripts and also a microphone. In one of the most famous manuscripts of Dunn's poetry, this poem has written in the margin, lengthwise up the page, the comment, why may not a man write his own epithalamium? An epithalamium An epithalamian is a marriage song. Sir Philip Sidney, uh, excuse me, Sir uh, Edmund Spencer wrote one to his wife. Dunn did write epithalamia. I think he wrote three of them, okay? And so whoever wrote, copied this poem in the manuscript said, why can't a, my, a man write his own epithalamian? The epithalamian isn't just about marriage per se, and even Spencer's does this. It, describes the relationship leading up to the marriage, the marriage day, and the day after. Okay? If this is Dunn's epithalamium, it's about one thing, the marriage night and the consummation of the marriage. Okay? It's a great poem, by the way. But we don't have time. If we had, if this were my seventh, if this were the 17th century, 17th century course, that I used to teach a long time ago, had, haven't been offered it in a while, um, we would read a lot more of that. So, all right, background's done. So, canonization, page 916. For God's sake, hold your tongue and let me love. Or chide my palsy or my gout. My five gray hairs, a ruined fortune flout. With wealth, your state, your mind, with arts improve. Take you a course, get you a place, observe his honor or his grace. And the king's real or his stamped face contemplate. What you will approve, so you will let me move. Now, notice the way I read that. The speaker's a bit exasperated. The speaker's essentially saying what? <coughs> Shut up and let's get busy. Let's get into bed. 
Okay? If you have to speak, chide my palsy, like my shaking hands. Probably not because of age, you know, sexual anxiety, or my gout. Now that's definitely age or illness. My five gray hairs, ruined fortune, flout. What is ruined fortune? It doesn't mean necessarily the same kind of uh, thing that we mean by fortune, like excessive wealth. It can mean bad luck. When Doug married, he had a string of bad luck afterwards. One of the things when King James took it into his mind, I want this guy to become my priest, he kind of shut all these other doors of advancement. All that Doug was essentially to do, able to do, from that period about 1603 until he took holy orders, is he worked off and on as a secretary to a man named Sir Robert Drury, handling his official correspondence, writing poems for him, probably, etc. Okay? So, with wealth, your state, notice with your mind, with arts, improve. So, improve your social standing with money. And improve your mind with what's he mean by arts? The humanities. There's a good justification right there for the liberal arts. Take you a course, get you a place. You've got footnotes down there. Observe his honor or his grace. His honor, a judge, his grace, a bishop. And the king's real or his stamped face. So the king's probably implies this poem is written after Elizabeth's death, death and James is now king. So how do you observe the king's real or stamped face? This couldn't be written, by the way, during Henry VIII's day. Because you could be executed if the king was walking by if you stood up and looked at the king. You had to, you had to be face to the ground in King in Henry VIII's presence. So the real face is to see the king face to face. Now, maybe not like up close, but you know, from a distance. Or his stamped face. Where do you see the king's stamped face? In money, in coins. Uh, um, contemplate. Whatever you want. Approve. And that's almost like a j'approve. I, I go for it. Whatever. Just let me love you. Alas, alas, who's injured by my love? What merchant ships have my sighs drowned? Who says my tears have overflowed his ground? When did my cold to forward spring remove? When did the heats which my veins fill add one more to the plaguey bill? Plaguey bill? The bill of death. The number of those dead by the plague. Every line here, every image is from Petrarch. It's part of the Petrarchan convention of poetry. A lover's sighs create hurricanes that destroy the, you know, crops. A lover's tears create floods that drown everything, etc. Soldiers find wars, and lawyers find out still litigious men. Still, always, continuously, constant, so what does he mean? Soldiers find wars, and lawyers find still litigious men. Notice, by the way, he's kind of making a joke there. What do lawyers always do? We call them, sorry, personal injury lawyers are called ambulance chasers. They're looking for the injured, okay? Soldiers, what? They look for wars to fight in. He's not talking about a nation's standing army. He's talking about mercenaries. When Dunn fought, he fought essentially as a mercenary. He wasn't fighting as part of the English Navy and such. Which quarrels move. Notice, quarrels are what cause wars. Quarrels are what cause constantly litigious men. Though she and I do. All this stuff happens even though we love each other. Call us 
what you will. We are made such by love. Whatever you call us, whatever that is, we are that because of love. So he's going to explain. Call her one, me, another fly. Your gloss down there tells you, call her a fly, butterfly or moth, and call me one too. Perfect example of a metaphysical conceit, which I don't remember if your introduction mentions or not. What is a metaphysical conceit? It's either Dryden or Johnson, Samuel Johnson or John Dryden, who said, I think it was Johnson, who said that a metaphysical conceit is the violent yoking together of two dissimilar things. So yoking together, like an ox's yoke, what does it do? It connects the ox to either the plow or a wagon kind of a thing. So you yoke two things that are dissimilar. What is he yoked? Her with a fly. Your gloss tells you moth or butterfly. Him with a fly. Himself. Okay, ladies, I'm going to, you know, pick on ladies for a minute. Do you want your lover to call you a fly? Because what do flies do? Dog on the ground. You know, the droppings left by dogs, flies go into that. Dead dogs, flies go into that. Really? You're comparing me to a fly? Call her one, me another fly. We're tapers too. Tapers. Candles. And at our own cost, die. How? How do candles die? They burn themselves out. That's the cost. The candle eats itself up. Okay? You got a footnote. We've already talked about this with Shakespeare's sonnets. To die was slang for orgasm. At our own cost is together we kill each other. And we in us find the eagle and the dove. Symbols of masculine strength, feminine gentleness. Now united in the lovers. Okay? So he's the eagle, she's the dove. The phoenix riddle hath more wit by us. <coughs> What's the phoenix riddle? What does the phoenix do? It reproduces asexually. A very scientific way of putting it. What's the non-scientific way? What's the phoenix do? It dies and is reborn. It self-immolates. It's once every 500 years, by the way, according to the myth. And out of the ashes in its nest, it's reborn. The phoenix riddle hath more wit by us. That is, it makes more sense when you look at the two of us. We two being one that is joined together are it. So to one neutral thing, both sexes fit. What's the speaker saying? When the two, the he and the her, are engaged in sex, they're what? They're no longer he and her. They're neutral. Because the he and the her cancel each other out, like a positive and a negative. We die and rise the same. We die, how? Orgasm, and then they get up again. And his implication is, and then we die again, and then we get up again, and then we die again, and then we get up again. And prove mysterious by this move. What's mysterious? What does the word mysterious mean? What's a mystery? When you don't know. When you don't know. Agatha Christie did not write mysteries. She wrote whodunits. Because at the end of Agatha Christie novel, what? You know who done it. A mystery is whoosh, something you cannot intellectually resolve. 
Usually, take it back. Good examples are found in the Christian church. The incarnation. Wrap your head around that one. The God who created everything that is outside time, outside the universe, becomes a seven pound, nine ounce, 19 inch long baby. Okay? Resurrection. Same kind of thing. So he says, we prove mysterious by this love. We can die by it, if not live by love. And if unfit for tombs and hers, our legend be, our story, right? Because what happens doesn't happen today. Today we get eulogies and obituaries. In Dunn's day, when important people died, people wrote poems about that person. Okay? If unfit for tombs and hearse our legend be, it will be fit for verse. Our story will be fit for poetry. That is meet and right, appropriate. And if no piece of chronicle reprove, Gloss tells you chronicle just means history, will build in sonnets pretty rooms. Sonnets, little love songs. So we won't build this big old mansion, but we'll build little rooms. As well, a well-wrought urn becomes the greatest ashes as half-acre tombs. A nicely made urn can be as fitting for the ashes of a corpse as can, you know, a massive mausoleum. And by these hymns, all shall approve us canonized for love. What hymns? The poems that will be told about their legend. Notice what the poet has done, or what the speaker has done. He's moved from, would you just shut up and let me have sex with you, to, now they're dead, and stories about us are going to become what? Hymns. What are hymns? Praises. And thus invoke us. So they're now not only praises, they, the lover and the beloved, have become what? Saints. Look at the title. The canonization. It's the canonization of the two lovers. They are being made into saints of love. Not like Eleanor Aquitaine and Andres Capolanis and the whole cult of love. Okay? This is different. And thus invoke us. That's how we know they're saints. Catholics pray to saints. Anglicans do not. Probably an indication if you want to kind of take it more literally, that this isn't written after Dunn becomes fully Anglican. Though even after he does become Anglican, I think Dunn still, there's a part of him, it hankers back to his Catholic beginnings and longing. Because even in some of his sermons, there are Catholic tendencies. Okay? You... This, and notice what comes after and thus invoke us. The thus means everything that comes after, this is part of the invocation. This is the prayer that is being said to the canonized lovers. <coughs> you whom reverend love made one another's hermitage. What's a hermitage? Not Andrew Jackson's house up in Nashville. It's a place where a hermit lives, right? Okay, so what's a hermit? Is this just somebody who says, you know, the world's a horrible, awful place, and I'm going to go off and live by myself, and if somebody steps on my lawn, I'm going to say, get off my yard! No. Is it, is it kind of like what, like what Jesus does going out to the wilderness for 40 days? Yes. Okay. It's a religious ascetic. You go and you live off alone. Why? So that you can try to conquer, not the world, but the world within. 
overcome sin, face temptation, all those kinds of things. So notice, you whom reverend love made one another's hermitage. She became his hermitage. He became her hermitage. They lived in each other. Yeah, there is a sex element there, but it's a much deeper spiritual element. You to whom love was peace that now is rage. Why was love peace? And why is it now rage? I mean, we could talk about influencers again. You know, so-called reality shows. How is, I've never watched one, literally. How is love depicted, though, from what I read? It's, you know, people are up and down. Why? Because they merely float on their passions rather than trying to control them. For them, love is peace. Why? It's not governed by what causes the up and down so much. I mean, this is very Dunian when you think of we at our own cost die, we die and rise again, die. Notice the symbolism of the hand, it goes down, and then oh look it. Yeah. Okay, very phallic. Here, this love isn't sex. This love is a spiritual love. You to whom love was what? Peace. It's a haven. Go back to Shakespeare's sonnet. 116. Love is what? It's that fixed point that fixed our, that looks down on all the tempests and is never shaken. Who did the whole world's soul contract and drove into the glasses of your eyes. The whole world gets shrunk down into the glasses. Glass here doesn't mean these. It means mirrors. So that when he looks into her eyes, he sees two things. He sees the whole world and he sees himself. And when she looks into him, she sees the whole world, meaning all men and herself. So made such mirrors and such spies that they did all to you epitomize. That is, when I look at you, I don't need to look at any other woman. You are all. When I look at you, I don't need to look at any other man. You are all men. That they did all to you epitomize, and what do they see? Countries, towns, courts. Notice, countries, large worlds, towns, civilized society, courts, the highest part of civilized society. I see everything. And this is what they thus invoke. We finally get to the big invocation. We beg from above a pattern of your love. Catholic tradition and in the Orthodox tradition. What is the purpose, so to speak, of a saint? Intercedes. Intercedes. Keep going. Bingo, they're an example to be followed. Okay? You have this pattern. Follow it. What does the cross say in the dream of the root? I did this and this, this. And now you go tell the world. Okay? Show us a pattern. Why? Because life down here is governed by what? Or is it governed by anything? It's topsy-turvy. And the speakers are saying, give us that peace that allows us to live calmly. Okay? Go from there to Valediction Forbidding Morning on 922. We are not going to get all these done. Valediction Forbidding Morning. I've already said, Valediction, it's a it's a going away speech. This one is forbidding morning. Dunn wrote three of these. Valediction forbidding morning, a valediction previous page, I think, forbidding weeping. Okay, so don't weep. And then a third one is a valediction of my name in a window. 
oddly enough. And when I was working on the Dunbury Orm, uh, one of the senior scholars on it, um, if I remember correctly, found that found the window. There's a window with Don, John Dunn's name inscribed in it. In fact, I think it has Ann Dunn's name also. I think, I'm not positive about that. So this is a valediction for many morning. According to Dunn's first biographer, <coughs> Isaac Walton, I think he's mentioned in your introduction, who also wrote a book on fishing, just a little side detail. Um, Dunn wrote this poem to his wife shortly before going on a trip to the continent with Sir Robert Drury, his employer. And his wife didn't want him to go, and more Dunn. Didn't want him to go because she had a premonition something bad was going to happen. She was pregnant at the time. And in 1611, we know Dunn did go on a trip to the continent, and while he was there, his wife delivered a stillborn child. Okay. <clears throat> As virtuous men pass mildly away and whisper to their souls to go, while some said, whilst some of their sad friends do say, the breath goes now, and some say no, so let us melt and make no noise. No tear floods, nor sigh tempests move. For profanation of our joys to tell the laity our love. Okay? So the first two stanzas are a big simile. As so. What's the purpose of the simile? How do virtuous men die? If you're familiar with Dylan Thomas's, do not go gentle into that good night. That is the opposite of how virtuous men die. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Okay. Just an absolutely beautiful villanelle. Virtuous men die how? Peacefully. Silently. They, they have no problems with the world. In fact, they die so peacefully and so quietly, people sitting around the deathbed are like, is he dead yet? I don't know. Take his pulse. Put a mirror up to the mouth. They whisper to their souls to go so that people sit around and go, is he dead? So let us melt. Melt. Dissolve. And make no noise. Let our separation, like the soul's separation of the body is silent, let our separation be silent. No tear floods, Petrarchan convention, nor side tempest move, Petrarchan convention. Why? Because it would be a profanation of our joys to tell the laity our love. And he introduces an idea that is pretty foreign for today. Who's the laity? What is laity? It's a religious term, exactly. It's the non clerical. The clerical is the priestly class. Priests, deacons, subdeacons, bishops, archbishops, if you have them within your church tradition, etc. The laity are the people out the pews. So the clergy are those who are initiated into, ordained into, performing, celebrating the rites and ritual, and the laity are the ones who benefit from that. So he says it would be a profanation of our joys to tell the laity our love. So what's the speaker saying about our love? It's religious possibly, or that could just be part of the metaphor. It's set apart. We are initiates into it. Nobody else will understand this. So it would make it what if we let other people know? It would profane it. It's holy now. If we let those people out there know, it will dirty it. See, I think those lines are an indication that possibly 
This poem isn't written to commemorate Dunn's going to the continent in 1611. There are other reasons to think it is, that the poem is. I'm just, you could read this poem as possibly having been written when their mirrors were still secret. Nobody knew. And so if he's getting ready to go away for a period, and she's like, oh, I don't want you to go, Johnny. I'll be so lonely. He said, he's, because what will happen? The laity, those who aren't initiated into knowledge of our love, will find out. And bad things can happen, okay? Moving of the earth brings harms and fears. Men reckon what it did and meant. But trepidation of the spheres, though great or far, is innocent. We talked the other day about the movement of the spheres. Copernicus in 1543, Mecca, Ptolemy 150 BC, suggested that the earth is the center of the universe and everything revolves around it. And everything is found in these nine concentric spheres that surround the earth. Outside those nine concentric spheres, is the Empyrean, which is where God dwells. Aristotle referred to God as the prima mobile, first or prime mover. God himself was unmoving, totally stationary, right? Part of his definition of God, so to speak. So God moves this first sphere, which moves the next sphere. Those two spheres move the next sphere, which move it all the way down. It's the source of horoscope astrology, power of the planets and all that kind of stuff over us now, right? So that date, dates from, sit from 150 BC. The Middle Ages, this idea becomes totally Christianized. So that each of these spheres has a ruling intelligence, an angelic being governing it, right? 1543, Copernicus posits the theory that the Earth is not the center of the universe, that the sun is the center of the solar system, and the earth revolves around it, as do all the other planets. Kepler essentially said the same, I believe a few years later. Tycho Brahe essentially said the same, also in the 16th century. It wasn't until 1610 that the theory was proven by Galileo. Galileo wrote up his findings, and anybody know what happened to him? The Catholic Church said, take it back. Mm -hmm. Because the Catholic Church said, this is the model. This is the standard model. This is how the universe works. Take it back or you die. He goes, oh, take what back? This, no, no, you never saw that. This is not the theory you think it is, <laughs> kind of a thing. He took it back. Shortly before his death, he took back his taking back. He recanted the recantation. In the Catholic Church, shortly after his death, said Galileo was right. Okay? What do you, you know, what do you, so, Galileo said it's a heliocentric. Why do I bring all this up? Movement of the spheres brings harm, movement of the earth brings harms and fears. Movement of the earth, earthquakes. Even today, 2023. If there were a massive earthquake, like if the Cascadia subduction zone off the coast of Canada, Washington, Oregon, Northern California rips, which it's due, it rips about every 300 years. The last major one estimated to be about a 9.2 in the year 1700. Tidal waves reached Japan, wiped out the coast of Japan. So these were big suckers. There's actually written proof of it. If that thing rips, it really rips, Portland will be gone, Portland, Oregon, and Vancouver will be gone, even though they're somewhat in, inland. Why? Because that tidal wave is going to come up the Columbia River. Okay? The coastline of Oregon, Northern California, probably inward 25 to 30 miles, will be underwater. I mean, just people, if that were to happen today, you would see as a major headline on, Dr on the Drudge Report, where is God? How can a good God allow bad things to happen? Because every time there's a major quake like that, that's one of the headlines that's out. Men wonder what it means. Now we understand plate tectonics, okay? 
But this kind of movement, the movement of the spheres, greater far, right? Because we're talking about stupid little continental plates. These are, you know, Mars, Uranus, Neptune, Jupiter, moving, etc. He says, this is innocent. Why? Because Galileo proved in 1610, none of the movements of these has anything to do with life down here. Why? Because these aren't real. Everything doesn't revolve around us. We revolve around the sun. But we, excuse me, dull sublunary lovers love whose soul is sense. It's an important little parenthesis. Cannot admit absence because it doth remove those things which elemented it. Dull sublunary lovers. Here's the earth. Here's the orbit of the moon. Everything from the orbit of the moon down to earth is sublunary. What is meant by that? It's impermanent. Impermanent. Imperm I should have canceled class today. It's impermanent. Mutable, meaning changeable. Um, as Heraclitus said, all is in flux down here. This is where fortune and chance rule, right? So that's dull sublunary lovers love. People whose love is dictated and determined by chance, whose soul is sense. So notice what he says about these kinds of lovers' love. The soul, the thing that makes their love, love is what? He says. Whose soul is sense, meaning... The five senses, right? Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. The soul, the thing that makes up their love are empirical things. Beautiful eyes, beautiful hair, beautiful body, beautiful voice, beautiful breath. Think Shakespeare's sonnet 130, my mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. Then in the breath that from my mistress Reeks, okay? Their love cannot admit absence. Why? What does absence do? We say, we have a, a phrase, absence what? Makes the heart grow fonder. According to the mentality in these lines, no it doesn't. Why? Because if your love for someone is based upon their physical being, and that is known only through the senses, when that person goes out the door, what happens to that love? It's gone too. So the mouse will do what when the cat's away? The mouse will play. So, oh, you weren't here. So I turned to her. <laughs> if you can't love the one you want, Stephen Bishop's song from the 1970s, love the one you're with. Because it doth remove those things which elemented it. But we, by a love so much refined that ourselves know not what it is, interassured of the mind, they care less, eyes, lips, and hands do less. Excuse me, Shakespeare's sonnet 116. How's it begin? Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. He's just said, the speaker has just said, our love is where? Interassured of the mind. What is assurance? Not insurance, assurance. Okay, what else? It's a promise, it's certainty. There's no doubt. Okay, our love is inter, between assured of the minds. I'm sure of her love, she's sure of my love. Okay? Our love is therefore refined because it's not based on what? 
What's the correct answer to, why do you love me? You said, oh man, honey, it's your great body. Yeah, because the body at 20 is not going to be the same body at 60. Uh, it's your smile. Mm, no. Hair? Mm, no. Eyes? No. Voice? Mm. If it's any one of, every one of those things is what? It's a particular. What's the correct answer to, why do you love me? I don't know, I just do. That's the best answer. If it's anything else, you're screwed. Okay? We care less. Eyes, lips, and hands to miss. Because the love ultimately doesn't have anything to do with eyes, lips, and hands. Our two souls, therefore, which are one. Why? Because they're into assured of the mind. He's equating mind with soul. Though I must go endure not yet a breach, but an expansion, like gold to airy thinness beat. Oh, our love is like gold. Great rich metal, you know, precious. He could have used lead, because lead is the same kind of metal as gold, malleable. You can pound gold thin enough to use as a window. Pretty stupid, because glass is a lot cheaper, and that would take a lot of gold to do that. Or you could use lead, and that would be extremely heavy, okay? He says, our souls which are one, why are they one? And the two shall become one, because they're married, probably. He says, our souls will become what? We'll like stretch out. They didn't have rubber bands in Dunn's day, but it'd be like a rubber band. If they be two, he says, they are two as stiff twin compasses. Are two. I always forget to bring one in. He's not talking compass like northeast, southwest. He's talking like the legs of a compass that you use to inscribe a circle. So there are two compasses like that. Metaphysical conceit, by the way. Our souls are like the legs of a compass. How wildly dissimilar is that? Okay. Thy soul, the fixed foot, so this is the one with the point on the end, makes no show to move, but doth that the other do. Well, wait a second. I could hold a compass here, and I could pull this leg out like this. This one hasn't moved. But if I wanted to inscribe a circle, what must I do? Where must the tip of this pencil be? It has to be on the same plane as this is. What's just happened? Notice this one bends after this one. The wider the circle, the more this one bends after it. That is intellectual genius for Dunn to do that. To say, you will hearken after me as I move away. That's only the first part of it. Thy soul, the fixed foot, fixed foot, makes no show to move, but doth that the other do. And though it, her soul, in the center sit, yet when the other far doth roam, it leans and hearkens after it. So no matter how far away I go, your fixed foot stays firm, but it does what? It leans. Okay? And grows erect as the other comes home. Right? Because that's not a perfect circle. Such wilt thou be to me, who must, like the other foot, obliquely run, obliquely at an angle from you. Thy firmness, her fixed foot, makes my circle just. Just meaning? Perfect. perfect. Why do we wear those who do, these, when we get married. Sign. Of? Commitment. And? Why, is, why don't we wear these? We could. You could wear something that is square. It would be a little uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Okay? 
Why else? Joint, 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 joint. Believe me, your joints will wear out. <laughs> I am living, walking proof. You know, they almost have an entire wing at TOA named after me because of all the surgery I've had. This, there's no joint. It's symbolic of eternity. There's no beginning, there is no end. Here, every line has a beginning and an end. You, by staying here, will do what? You will draw me back. You will make my journey complete. And the implication is, and if you don't stay here, what does the speaker lose? The anchor point. Or to use Shakespeare's language in Sonnet 116, the fixed star, the mark that draws him back. That is a beautiful love poem when you take it apart and understand everything in it. Uh, ecstasy, we don't have time to do the ecstasy. Let me see. We don't have time to do meditation 17 either. Um, what else do we have after that? We have. Okay, we'll start the ecstasy. I may not read all of it. No, in fact, I won't read all of it. What do we see in the ecstasy? Somebody describe the action, so to speak. What occurs? Heather, by the look. The title, the very first. Okay, what's the title mean? Doesn't mean sexual ecstasy. It's not orgasm. It's not the orgasm. What is an ecstasy? Literally, it comes from ancient Greek. It's an out of body experience. It's where the soul leaves the body. Well, what do we see here? We see two bodies, a man and a woman, sitting on a riverbank. Okay? looking at each other, holding hands. And that's all they do all day long, we're told in this poem. Their hands are cemented together by a balm, probably sweat. If you hold hands for too long, that's going to happen. Heat gets generated, okay? Where are their souls? So he's here looking at her. She's here looking at him. His soul leaves his body, her soul leaves her body, and they like sepulchral, sepulchral statues lay. So they're looking at each other. Why do their souls grow out of their body? So that they can have a prenup. It's a, I mean, it's a modern idea. Their souls are going to negotiate, we're told. As twixt two armies, our souls, line 15, to advance their state, that is, his soul wanted to argue for his position. Her soul wanted to argue for her position. They hang over each of them. And we're told all day they stood there. But if anyone who was refined by love, refined meaning what? What do you do when you refine something? What else? For what purpose? Okay. Keep going. What's the best of better? Perfect. To purify it. To perfect it. So if somebody who was purified by love, perfect love, came and watched, what would they see slash hear? They would hear this conversation. Why? Because this soul said something, and this soul said something, and they both were going to be told, spake and meant the same. They say the exact same things to each other. And he might thence a new concoction, okay? Take. A concoction is when you make something together and you make something new out of it. But in doing so, you make something purer. So someone refined by love would depart from seeing this, what? Even 
more purified. Why? How do you get more pure than pure? It's a New Testament idea. St. Paul talks about in heaven, the individuals in heaven will go from glory to glory. They will always become more and more and more like God. They will never become God because God is wholly separate, but they'll become more and more like. And here's what they will he hear. This ecstasy doth unperplex, we said, and tell us what we love. What was the question I asked earlier? What's the correct answer to why do you love me? Why do you ask the question? To be unperplexed. I don't know why you love me. My wife and I will do something else. I don't know why you stuck with me all these years. No. This question, this ecstasy doth unperplex. That is, when their souls are down in their bodies, he looks at her and goes, I don't know why you love me. She looks at him, I don't know why you love me. When the souls leave the bodies, now they understand. It tells us what we love. We see, and I know it's 926, by this, it was not sex. I don't love you solely, let's throw that in, for sex. Okay? We'll stop there. We'll pick up with this on Tuesday. Uh, we're at least going to do, we're going to finish the ecstasy and we've got, we're going to, we have to do meditation 17 because everybody needs to know, you know, why the bells toll and for whom the bells toll. Have a good weekend. I do not have your, um, if you submitted